Good afternoon and welcome to today's briefing. The Reserve Bank Board met this morning by video conference. At that meeting, we agreed on policy measures that will provide ongoing and important, source of, uh, important support to the Australian economy as it continues its recovery. In particular, we decided first to retain the April 2024 bond as the bond for the yield target and to retain the target of 10 basis points. Second, we decided to continue purchasing government bonds after the completion of the current bond purchase program in September. We will purchase $4 billion of bonds a week until at least mid-November. And third, we decided to maintain the cash rate target at 10 basis points and the interest rate on exchange settlement balances of 0%. The Reserve Bank Board is committed to achieving its goals of full employment and inflation consistent with the target. Our strategy is to do what we reasonably can with monetary policy to achieve low unemployment in Australia and a rate of inflation that is sustainably within the 2 to 3% range. Today's decisions, together with those we've taken previously, have us on a path to achieve those objectives. Today's decisions were taken against the backdrop of an economy that's bounced back earlier and stronger than we had expected. The Australian economy is on a positive path. Output is now above its pre-pandemic level and more Australians have a job today than they did before the pandemic. The unemployment rate has returned to its pre-pandemic level, underemployment has declined and job vacancies are at a very high level. So we're in a much better position than we thought we'd be in. The recent outbreaks of the virus and the lockdowns will, a strength of the, will affect the strength of the recovery in the near term. But Australia's experience has been that once an outbreak is contained and the restrictions are lifted, the economy bounces back very quickly and we could expect the same to be the case here. Recent events have, however, reminded us that it is difficult to predict the future. It's possible that we experience further setbacks and we need to be prepared for that. But it's also possible that we experience further positive surprises on the economy. For most of this year, we've had a run of better than expected data and it's entirely possible that this could continue. On the nominal side of the economy, we have not seen the same upside surprises in wages and prices that we've experienced in jobs and output. Both aggregate wage growth and underlying inflation remain subdued, and we expect this to remain the case for some time yet. One issue that we're watching carefully, though, is how the balance of supply and demand in the labour market is being affected by the closure of our international borders. There have been increased reports of labour shortages in parts of the country and there has been a step up in wage increases for some occupations. Even so, wage increases for most Australians are still modest and the expected pickup in overall wages growth and prices is forecast to be only gradual. So that's the backdrop against which we made our decisions today. I'd now like to turn to the specifics and first to the yield target. The three-year yield target was introduced in March last year during an exceptional period. It served its purpose of lowering funding costs in Australia and reinforcing the board's forward guidance about the cash rate. In my view, it's been a successful monetary policy measure. At the time the target was introduced, the board judged that the probability of the cash rate increasing over the subsequent three years, which at the time ran until early 23, was extremely low. In March last year, there were credible predictions that Australia's health system would be overwhelmed and it was difficult to envisage scenarios in which interest rates would need to be increased before early 23. The board recognised that the pandemic was going to be a major drag on the economy and that the recovery would require an extended period of very low interest rates in Australia, particularly given the already low rate of inflation we're experiencing. In these circumstances, the board adopted a target for the yield on the three-year government bond, which at the time had a maturity date of April 23. Now, 16 months on, the maturity date for the three-year bond has moved to April 24, and it would soon move to November 24. 
So the board has once again considered the likelihood of an increase in the cash rate over a three year window, which now extends out to November 24. The situation today is quite different from that that we faced in March last year. We're no longer looking over a cliff, but instead we're transitioning from recovery to expansion. This improvement has widened the range of plausible scenarios for the cash rate. Our central scenario continues to be that the condition for a rise in the cash rate will not be met until 2024, but there are alternative plausible scenarios as well. This means that the probabilities have shifted and the decision to adjust the approach to the yield target reflects this shift in probabilities. In particular, the board has decided to maintain the April 24 bond as the target bond. This means that as time passes, the maturity of the yield target will naturally decline. The board remains committed to the target of 10 basis points, which is at the same rate as the target for the cash rate. As has been the case since the target was introduced, we stand ready to operate in the market to support that target if that's necessary. I'd now like to turn to the bond purchase program. This program has lowered risk-free yields across the entire yield curve in Australia, and in doing so, it's lowered funding costs for all borrowers in Australia. In turn, this has contributed to a lower exchange rate than otherwise, it's freed up cash flow for households and for businesses, and it's strengthened balance sheets by supporting asset values. The bond purchases have also led to portfolio rebalancing by investors, and this too has supported the prices of other assets. It's through these channels that our bond purchases have supported the economic recovery in Australia. The second $100 billion tranche of purchases will be completed in early September, and we will continue to purchase bonds after this date, providing ongoing support to the Australian economy. We'll continue to do so in the current 80-20 split between Australian government securities and the securities issued by the states and territories. And these purchases will be at the rate of $4 billion a week, rather than the $5 billion a week under the current program. The board will next review the rate of purchases at its November meeting. Its decision to do so, rather than to lock in the volume of purchases for a longer period, reflects the balance of two considerations. The first is the benefit of being able to respond in a timely way to the flow of economic news. In a world characterised by a high degree of uncertainty, there is benefit from not being locked into a particular path for an extended period. The second consideration is that our guidance about future bond purchases helps with market pricing. The more information the market has about these purchases, the more efficient they can be reflected in current market prices. The board's judgment is that reviewing the situation in November strikes the right balance. It allows the possibility of a timely recalibration of the bank's bond purchases in either direction. It also provides as much guidance about future bond purchases as we reasonably can in an uncertain world. We are not locked into any particular path and bond purchases could be scaled up again if economic conditions warrant doing so. As I've discussed on previous occasions, the reviews of our bond purchases take into account three factors. First, the effectiveness of the bond purchases that we've undertaken. Second, the decisions of other central banks. And third, and most importantly, progress towards our goals of full employment and inflation consistent with the target. And we'll use this same framework in our future reviews. We will continue buying bonds until there is further material progress towards our goals of full employment and inflation. We want to see clear evidence that the stronger economy is translating into a pickup in wages and a lift in inflation towards the target. We will also be reviewing the ongoing rate of purchases in light of our forecast for future progress towards our goals. So both the outcomes and the forecasts are important here and today's announcement reflects this general decision-making framework. We are still well short of our goals of full employment and inflation, and this means that a continuation of monetary support through bond purchases is appropriate. At the same time, though, the economy is on a better path than we had earlier expected, and the outlook has improved. 
We've responded to this improved situation by adjusting the weekly rate of purchases from 5 billion to 4 billion. The additional bond purchases that we're announcing today provide an ongoing important source of support to the Australian economy. I want to emphasise that the step down from 5 billion to 4 billion does not represent a withdrawal of support by the RBA. The evidence is that central bank bond purchases have their impact through the total stock of bond purchases, not the flow of those purchases. By mid-November, our cumulative purchases under the bond purchase program will have amounted to $237 billion. We will hold a little more than 30% of Australian government bonds on issue and a little more than 15% of state and territory bonds on issue. This represents a substantial and ongoing degree of support for the Australian economy. The adjustment in the rate of weekly purchases does not change that. The final part of today's decision was to maintain the cash rate target at 10 basis points and the interest rate on exchange settlement balances at zero. The board does not intend to increase the cash rate until inflation is sustainably within the 2 to 3% range. It's not enough for inflation to be forecast to be in this range. We want to see results before we change the cash rate. Any increase in the cash rate will, be, will take place after bond purchases have ended. For inflation to be sustainably within the 2 to 3% range, it's likely that wages growth will need to exceed 3%. That's on the basis that labour productivity continues to increase and that the labour share of national income remains broadly steady. The current rate of wages growth is materially less than 3% and we expect it will be a few years before it increases back above 3%. Further progress on reducing unemployment and underemployment will be needed to get there. I want to make it clear that this focus on wages does not mean we have a target for wages growth or that wages growth has to have cleared a specific benchmark before we adjust interest rates. The condition for a lift in the cash rate relates to inflation, not to wages. It's clear that inflation can increase for reasons unrelated to wages and there'll be another example of this in the June quarter when the CPI inflation rate spikes to 3.5 per cent. Even though this, is the, this will be the experience in the June quarter, history teaches us that sustained changes in the inflation rate are accompanied by sustained changes in the growth of unit labour costs. So over time, these two do go together. When the RBA staff last prepared a full set of forecasts in May, the central forecast was for growth in the wage price index to pick up, but to do so only gradually. For inflation, the central forecast was for it to reach just 2% by mid-23. And this is the basis of our guidance, that we do not expect the cash rate to be increased until 2024 at the earliest. I want to emphasise that the point. That, sorry, I want to emphasise the point that the condition for an increase in the cash rate depends upon the data, not the date. It's based on inflation outcomes, not the calendar. The central scenario remains that the condition for a lift in the cash rate will not be met until 2024. So let me conclude. The Australian economy has bounced back earlier and stronger than expected. More Australians have jobs today than they did before the pandemic. That's very good news. Even so, we are still well short of our goals of full employment and inflation consistent with the target. The RBA is committed to achieving those targets. Today's decisions maintain the support of monetary conditions that are needed to do this. Thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is from Tapas Strickland from NAB. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Governor Lowe. I just wanted to get some clarification on what exactly inflation being sustainably a target is, if it's not necessarily linked towards wages growth at a specific rate. Uh, are you able to elaborate on how long inflation needs to be 
within the 2 to 3% band to be considered to be sustainably at target. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have a specific rule here, but let me explain uh, our general thinking. It's not going to be enough for inflation just to trip across uh, at 2% and be 2.1% 2, 2 for a quarter. We'll want to see inflation above 2% for, for a number of quarters, and we'll want to be confident that we'll stay within the 2 to 3% range. In terms of uh, seeking that confidence, we'll be looking very much at growth in wages. As I said, uh, for inflation to be sustainably within two to three, wage growth will have to be sustainably above three. So we, first of all, we've got to get there. We've got to get above 2% and sustain that for a while. And then we've got to be looking, when looking forward, you've got to be confident that it's going to stay there. And I think wages growth will be key to that. So we don't have a rule, but that's the general approach we'll be taking. First get there and then be confident we're going to stay there and uh, in seeking that confidence we'll be looking very much at wages growth. Thank you. The next question is from Ross Greenwood from Sky News. Please go ahead. Uh, Governor Lowe, two related questions. The first is in regards to your view of what is full employment now. Um, does that, uh, in your mind, have a four in front of it or a three in front of it? And the second one is in regards to the wages inflation. How much of your assumption is based on the timing of the reopening of international borders? In terms of uh, full employment, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Uh, I suspect uh, what we've got to do is keep the unemployment rate in the low fours for a period of time. The reason, or one reason I'm uncertain is we haven't been in that territory uh, very much in the last 40 or 50 years. We're at 4% unemployment for a brief period during the resources boom, but it was only for a brief period, and then you've got to go back um, more than four decades. So we don't have very much historical experience uh, to draw on. The evidence that we do have, though, suggests that uh, we have to have an unemployment rate below five, and I think probably close to 4%. Uh, time will tell, though. I hope we can do better than that, but we don't have very much historical experience uh, to draw on. Uh, you asked about uh, whether the forecasts can, are conditional on opening of the borders. Uh, in the um, short term, the closure of the borders, I think, is having a significant effect on the economy. It's obviously affecting people's lives and it's affecting business decisions and it's affecting the labour market. Uh, we're working under the uh, assumption that uh, sometime over the next year these, the borders will be gradually opened, uh, particularly for workers who have skills that are in short supply. Uh, if in 18 months or two years we're still in the situation that we're currently in with the borders closed, I think the inflation and wage dynamics, dynamics would be quite different. But I think it's a plausible central case that uh, over the next year we see a gradual opening of the borders, particularly for workers who have skills in short supply. Time will tell, though. Thank you. The next question is from Phil O'Donoghue from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, Governor Lowe, today you've indicated that you do not expect conditions for a high cash rate to be in place before 2024. I was wondering though, if you could walk us through what will happen to the yield target if rate conditions emerge more, rate high conditions emerge more than you expect. So for example, if you ultimately see fit to hike in 2023, Will you simply raise the April 24 yield target as well, or does it make more sense in that scenario to simply abandon the target altogether? We're talking hypotheticals here, aren't we? But in principle, the cash rate target and the three, or the, the I shouldn't call it the three yield target anymore, the yield target uh, go together. So we think about those as a package. As I said in my opening remarks, we still are of the view that it's unlikely that the cash rate will be increased before 2024. And perhaps uh, let me run through that logic again. Uh, for um, inflation to be sustainably within the 2 to 3% range, I think we're going to have to wage growth above 3 as I said. The last time wage growth was above 3% in Australia was a decade ago. 
over a decade, it went from above three down to one and a half. I don't think it's particularly likely that it shoots back up to above 3% over the next 18 months. I think wage increases will get a bit larger, but aggregate wage growth, I think, is, is likely to be below 3% for the next couple of years. And until wage growth is above 3%, I have trouble uh, with the notion that inflation could be sustainably in the 2 to 3%. So if you think we're going to raise interest rates in 2023, you've got to have a, a much more a positive forecast of wages growth than we currently have, which would require the dynamics in the labour market to be very different to those that have been at work over the past decade. Those uh, dynamics have been pretty powerful. There's uh, been a big increase in labour supply, I spoke last week about the mindset of businesses, about their uh, perceptions that they have difficulty raising prices and therefore they want to keep control of their costs. So all those dynamics would have to change fundamentally to get wages growth up above 3% in the next 18 months and therefore inflation um, higher than it currently is. So that's the, that's the logic for um, thinking that way inflation is not going to rise sustainably to be in the 2 to 3 per cent range until 24, and therefore interest rates. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Shane Wright from The Age. Please go ahead. Oh, good day, Governor. I just want to follow up on the question that uh, Ross asked. And what do you believe, or what do you think the impact of the reopening of the international borders means to the jobs market and to wages growth? Is that part of your central scenario, that that is a downward pressure on wages growth and on jobs growth? Well, the opening of the borders will be good news for the economy, won't it? So uh, it'll, it'll allow... Uh, well, it'll be good news at kind of the individual level. People will be able to go and um, catch up with family and friends and travel internationally again. But it's also important for businesses. Uh, we hear um, reports from businesses we talk to that one of the reasons they're not investing at the moment is they can't get the uh, skilled workers from overseas to uh, put in place the new capital equipment or test it out. So it's affecting... Uh, business investment at the moment. So it will be good news for the economy when the borders open. At the moment, uh, as I said before, the closure of the borders is affecting the market for some skills, some type of work, some type of labour. And it is putting upward pressure on um, uh, the wages for those people. Uh, if and when we open the border, I think some of that pressure will come out of the system. Uh, but until, that, uh, remain, until that's the case, I think we're going to see these pockets of pressure remain and uh, it's going to be there until the borders open. So one possibility here is that the borders stay closed for an extended period, wage growth lifts, uh, we, and re-establish norms of 3% um, for wages growth rather than the current norm of 2%. And then um, the borders open, allowing um, businesses to expand and invest again. So it's a, it's a first order issue, both in terms of constraining uh, businesses' investment and output decisions and in affecting the labour market. Thank you. The next question is from Stephen Halmerick from Commonwealth Bank. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity. Uh, just thinking about the quantitative easing program, what type of conditions uh, would have been met for you to consider a further tapering of that QE program come November? And I guess a related question which uh, relates to Phil's question, you know, what type of conditions would you need to see to bring forward that cash rate guidance of 2024? Uh, well, on the cash rate yeah. guidance, that, that, you know, for that to, to fundamentally shift from 24 to 23, we would need to see strong, unequivocal evidence that the, that the pickup in the economy is translating into wages growth and inflation more quickly than we had expected. As I talked about a few minutes ago, there are these really fundamental and structural factors that are keeping that have kept wages growth low for a decade. So I'd, we'd need to be convinced that those factors have gone away and been replaced by a new set of factors. It doesn't seem particularly likely. You can't rule it out completely, but it doesn't seem um, 
particularly likely. Uh, in terms of the bond purchases, again, we will first want to see clear evidence that the stronger economy is uh, leading to a pickup in, in inflation pressures. And to date, we haven't seen that. The economy is uh, surprised massively on the upside, but the wage and inflation outcomes have been pretty much in line with our expectations. So we have not yet seen evidence that the stronger economy is translating into stronger prices and wage pressures. That reflects some of the structural factors that I was just talking about. Those factors will gradually wane over time, but before we scale back bond purchases further, we'd want to see further evidence that, or some evidence that uh, the stronger nominal, that the stronger real economy is translating into a stronger nominal economy. So we're waiting for the evidence here. We hope and expect that this will happen, but it's a slow and drawn out process. Thank you. The next question comes from Michael Janda from ABC. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Philip Lowe. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. The, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Fed and the Canadian Central Bank have all been hinting at rate rises in 2023 or even potentially as early as next year. Um, first of all, what effect does that have on your outlook and thinking around rates, if any? And, and secondly, Australia is supposed to have had one of the best economic recoveries uh, through the COVID pandemic. If those central banks are talking about rates rising potentially as soon as next year, how come we're still looking at 2024? Yep, well, we're certainly not hinting at rate increases in 2023. Uh, if other central banks uh, increase rates in 23, the main transmission mechanism uh, of those increases to us is through the exchange rate. Uh, you would expect their exchange rates to go up a little bit and uh, uh, the Australian dollar to depreciate against the currencies where the central banks are increasing rates. So that's one transmission mechanism. It's not particularly powerful, but it is one. The more um, fundamental question is why are other central banks even hinting at interest rate increases in 2023 and we're not? And the, the answer to that is, uh, first of all, that uh, the inflation outcomes in Australia are further away from the target. Uh, so in, the, in Canada, the, uh, the underlying inflation rate is quite close to the, the Bank of Canada's target. Here in Australia, we've been below the target for too many years and the prospect of reaching the target in the short term is not particularly high. It's um, partly linked to the issue of wages that I talked about. Wage growth in Australia had slowed by more than it had in most other countries even before the pandemic and we had a particularly large response in, in wages during the pandemic as well. So wage growth had fallen by more and it stepped down again during the pandemic. So even though the real economy in Australia has been much better than in almost any other Western country, the outcomes for inflation and wages have not been better. And we're further away from where we should be on both those key variables, which the central bank is responsible for. So we want to do what we can to get those nominal variables, that is wage growth and inflation, back to target. I think it's, it's really important we do that because sometimes people say, well, why do you want to get inflation back to, um, to 2 to 3 per cent? And the, the main reason um, that we want to get it back is if, you get, if we can get inf inflation back to 2 to 3 per cent, then over time interest rates can normalise and be higher. Uh, and that gives us the capability to lower interest rates in the next downturn. We're very focused at the moment on the current downturn, rightly, but we know in the future there'll be further downturns in the economy and we want to have a monetary policy tool to respond to those downturns. So it's important for macroeconomic management that over time interest rates can normalise and interest rates can only normalise if we can get the nominal part of the economy growing around the, the uh, target. So that's, we, we want to make sure that happens and we'll keep the monetary stimulus going until it does. And uh, because the inflation and wage outcomes have been lower in Australia than other places, we're going to keep the stimulus going probably longer than the other countries. Thank you. The next question is from Tapas Strickland from NAB. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Governor Lowe. I just wanted to elaborate on some of your comments in a post-board statement on um, house prices and the strength in the housing market. And you notice that there has been increased borrowing by investors. Uh, are there any indicators that we should look at that would concern you that would prompt uh, the RBA and APRA to tighten up macro prudential tools? Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't want to highlight any particular indicators, but perhaps I can um, highlight for you the issues we're focusing on. Uh, we had an extensive discussion at this at the most recent Council of Financial Regulators meeting. We're looking very closely at the bank's lending standards. If we saw a deterioration in those lending standards, then both APRA and uh, the Reserve Bank would um, be looking for, for actions as we did a number of years ago. At the moment, I don't see um, any evidence that there's been a uh, deterioration in lending standards, but we're watching that carefully. So that's one issue. The second issue is the sustainability of trends in household credit. Credit growth has uh, picked up. It's running at 6 or 7% and it's going to pick up further. What uh, neither APRA or the Reserve Bank want to see is uh, credit growing too quickly relative to people's incomes. We've, uh, in Australia, got quite high levels of household debt already. In my view, it's in, not in the country's long-term interest to have debt increasing at a much, much uh, more, a much higher rate than people's income. So if we saw a large and sustained gap in household credit growth relative to income growth, then uh, we would be looking at uh, various policy responses to deal with that. So it's really about the sustainability of the trends in household debt relative to household income. At the moment, I, we haven't got a problem here. Household debt growth, it's higher than income, but not, uh, not massively higher. Uh, but if we got a situation where household debt was growing much, much quicker than income, and that, looks like, and that looked like it was going to be sustained, you could expect us to be exploring options uh, a bit more aggressively than we are now. The type of things that we've been uh, considering, uh, there are three, uh, looking at the interest serviceability buffer, the, the buffer that uh, banks have to add on to the interest rate they charge you when they're making the loan. Uh, I notice that in Canada they've increased that buffer recently. Uh, we're also working through the merits of uh, portfolio loan to value restrictions and portfolio debt to income restrictions. So they're the things that we're working through. I don't see a need to, uh, to move on any of those uh, areas at the moment. Ultimately, it's a matter for APRA, but we're watching very carefully the, the trends in household debt. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Ryan from ABC. Please go ahead. Yes, so good afternoon, Governor Lowe. Thanks for the opportunity this afternoon. I just wanted to um, get your views on the current situation with uh, vaccines. There's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, confusion or frustration about the delays. Are you concerned that uh, delays or a, um, a sluggish rollout in the vaccines is uh, becoming a big complication in the economic recovery? I think the sooner we can all get vaccinated and open up, the better the economic recovery is going to be. That's um, stating the obvious. Uh, so I understand people's frustration, the closure of the borders and the slow rollout of the vaccine. It's kind of affecting people at a very personal level. Uh, it's also affecting businesses I talked about before. But I do think we also need to remember that we will get through this. And we need to be patient. In the foreseeable future, let's say by the end of the year, within six months, most of us will be vaccinated. Our lives will start to return to normal. We'll be able to travel again and enjoy one another's company and businesses will be able to do the things they need to do to employ people and invest. We all want that to happen today and it's understandable we want that to happen today. But I think we've got to be patient. And within six months' time, I think most of us will have at least had... Uh, one shot of the vaccine and life will start returning to normal. Uh, 
that will happen more quickly the more of us get vaccinated. So it's not um, at the moment a concern for the medium term outlook for the economy as we're working under the premise that by the end of this year the vast bulk of people who want the first shot of the vaccine will be able to have it. And I think we'll start to see things return to normal then. But we need to be patient and not forget that within, within not too far in the future, most of us will be vaccinated. We want it to happen earlier, don't we? But uh, it will happen within six months. Thank you. The next question comes from Prashant Nunaha from kdsecurities.com. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Governor Lowe. Um, at the moment, the, the board feels fairly comfortable with the economy bouncing back uh, after restrictions are eased. Um, just wanted to get an idea on how the board sees upside risks uh, versus its central forecasts, uh, given the current lockdown. And does the board have a view on where they think the peak in the cash rate is in this cycle? Uh, we have not discussed the peak in the cash rate. <laughs> the moment it's, um, it's at the floor and uh, we're not uh, looking forward to the peak and it coming down again, so I can't um, answer that. I'm sorry. And the first part of the question was... I was just, just uh, the first part of the in question. regards to how comfortable does the board feel uh, with regards to the upside risk the upside. versus their central forecast? Um, uh, are you having a few doubts on your central forecast? Do you see the risk to the upside, um, give, given despite the current lockdown? Well, the economy's um, clearly been stronger than we'd expected, so I think in the next forecast round, we will see further upward revisions to the forecasts. Uh, just um, to kind of wind the clock back to February. In February, we thought the unemployment rate today would be six and a half percent. It's 5.1. And we didn't think we'd be getting back to 5% um, unemployment until mid-2023. So we've done a lot better than expected, certainly since February and even uh, since May, the data have come in better than expected. So I could imagine uh, that when we go through the forecasting process over the next uh, month or so, there'll be further upward revisions to our forecasts. What we haven't seen is the same upside surprises on wages and inflation. So this is really what we're looking for. Uh, you asked about upside risks. Uh, there's, there's a potential upside risk to wages from the closure of the borders. As I said in answer to a previous question, if the borders remain closed for, for a very extended period of time, I think we'll see more and more of these pressures in the labour market that we're currently seeing. and it's. It's conceivable that could uh, change the uh, dynamics in the labour market. Some people might think that's positive, but it comes at the cost of businesses not being able to get the people they need to do the investment and expansion. So there is an upside risk on inflation um, and wages from the closure of the borders. So we're paying close attention to that. I th expect, though, that um, over the next six months to a year, the borders will gradually open, particularly for people who have skills in short supply. If that doesn't happen, we'll see more of these um, hot spots in the labour market. Thank you. Once again, please press star one if you wish to ask a question. That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.